So last time I introduced the Kodaira dimension of a, an alge a smooth algebraic variety, which was defined in terms of the rate of growth of the space of sections of uh, the canonical bundle and its multiples. Uh, it was a particular case of the Itaka dimension for an arbitrary line bundle. And in particular, we saw what the Kodaira dimension of various curves are. So if, uh, so this is basically P1, this is basically an elliptic curve, and this is another, other curves. And we want to see to what extent this um, birational invariant that we attach to a variety enables us to distinguish varieties which are in some sense, some sense have something to do with P1 uh, from varieties which in some sense have something to do with E or maybe those of general type, namely where the Kodaira dimension equals the dimension, which are more like curves of higher genus. It may be something in between. And since this is uh, an, an arithmetic geometry uh, con uh, workshop, well, we'll, we'd like to know what it says about the arithmetic of these varieties. But uh, for the time being, let's do a little bit of geometry, of birational geometry, uh, and study the b just a little bit about the behavior of this thing. There's a, there's a, and one of the exercises is, it's called easy subadditivity. So uh, notice this additivity in products. You can ask what about varieties which are not exactly products, but that are fibered. Well, you, you can, say an exact thing in this uh, situation because you can fiber up to birational equivalence, you can fiber any variety over P1. So um, in some sense, the, the, the base is, is uh, you can fiber over P1 with, and in fact you can fiber it over P1 with, uh, with fibers which are of general type. But what you have is an, uh, is an inequality. So if the fibers, this is the, the generic fiber, X eta B. So I, I, should, I, I should draw the picture. I have my X and it maps to B. And here I have the generic point and here I have X eta B. And so, so the, the Kodaira dimension of, so what this says is if, if you lost something, you, uh, if, it's, if the generical, generic fiber is not of general type, so there's some, some defect in terms of Kodaira dimension, then the same defect at least will occur in the variety in the total space. The a particularly important case is when, when the fiber is, is P1 or something like P1. Uh, so here's a definition. We say that the variety is uniruled if there is a variety B of dimension one less and a dominant rational map B cross P1 to X. So So this is not exactly fibration on X, but at least we have something which is fibered by P1s and a dominant rational map. Well, this might be just a rational map, but everything is birational equivalent. So, so that's a uniruled variety by uh, what we have here, or in fact the additivity there. If you have any variety, B cross P1 will always have Kodaira dimension minus infinity. Another thing that is, that is easy to see is, well, since this is dimension N minus one, uh, well, this is a dominant rational map, this means that this is of the same dimension. So this is, uh, this is generically finite. And it's easy to see that the Kodaira dimension if you take a generically finite cover, the Kodaira dimension can only grow because any differential form here pulls back to a differential form here. So the space of differentials only grows. So if this has Kodaira dimension minus infinity, this must have Kodaira dimension minus infinity. This is what, so if, 
if your variety is covered by P1s, this is what it, this says. If your variety is covered by P1s, then uh, the Coderre dimension has to be minus infinity. And the converse is an important uh, conjecture, sometimes called the minus infinity conjecture. Uh, I forget to whom one should at at attribute it, but uh, maybe f in the final notes it will, it will find it. Uh, so, and, and it follows from, uh, from the existence of good minimal models. It's, a, um, it's part of the, uh, the, the sufficiently enlarged minimal model program which I will discuss uh, in a, later in, in this course. And the conjecture is that this is an if and only if. The only way a variety can ha fail to have any differential forms whatsoever, uh, canonical and pluricanonical differential forms whatsoever, is if it's covered by rational curves. Yes? Mori attributes it to Mumford. Okay, so maybe Mumford Mori. Uh, Conjecture. Anyway, minus infinity conjecture is a good name because then you remember what it's about. Uh, the only trouble is that we don't give credit this, this way to the right people. So we are basically, okay, so here's, here's what happens with surfaces which ex uh, really explains why uh, general type is called, ge is called general type. For surfaces, we can completely, sort of completely classify the varieties which are, the surfaces which are not of general type. So I'll add here two, could I dimension two? General type, it just means it's too crazy to uh, classify. People have been working for decades trying to say something about what can happen. What are the things that can and cannot happen in the zoo of, of surfaces of general type? But surfaces not of general type are completely classified uh, up to birational equivalence. Um, so any surface of Coderre dimension minus infinity is covered by P1. So the conjecture stated there is true for surfaces. It's also true for threefolds, but that's a much harder result. But no, this is up to birational equivalence. <coughs> so these are so that so these are either rational or ruled surfaces over some curve. Uh, Coderre dimension zero is a collection of situations. Each one is fairly explicitly understood. Abelian surfaces, they are parameterized by a countable collection of uh, modulized spaces. Um, by elliptic surfaces, these are quotient, I think they have been mentioned um, somewhere, uh, I forget whose, whose lecture. Say again? Hararis. Um, so by elliptic surfaces are uh, surfaces that are quotients of products of two elliptic surfaces by an exotic um, automorphism group. We'll, we'll, I'll give you an example that is uh, very important later on. K3 surfaces are a collection of surfaces that have very interesting geometry and uh, you can spend a lifetime studying K3 surfaces and Enrique's surfaces are certain quotients of K3 surfaces by a certain type of involution. And Coderre dimension one, I wrote here many elliptic surfaces. Uh, so uh, by the, um, that additivity, if, if, uh, if the dimension of the base is one and the dimension of the fiber and the Coderre dimension of the fiber is zero, namely the fiber is an elliptic curve, then the Coderre dimension is at most one. And in fact, the, it can be minus infinity, it can be uh, zero, it can be one. And uh, the cases which, in which it's one are, so every, uh, every surface of Coderre dimension one is an elliptic surface, is a surface fibered by elliptic curves.
Okay. This. So I'm, I'm going to uh, mention a few things that were, I think were covered by, by Hassett and by Starr last week. Wait, I'm a bit confused. So uh, I want to now analyze the, the, the types of varieties that can occur at least uh, in terms of the code. I had mentioned at least roughly. So the, the first things, uh, according to the conjecture that I just removed, uh, the, the first thing that I want to uh, understand is the minus infinity case. And by the conjecture, these minus infinity cases are covered by rational curves. So they have something to do with rational curves, and I would like to see to what, so the, the, the goal is to, to break a variety of Kodair dimension minus infinity into two pieces. One is everything that has to do with rational curves, and the other is the rest. And that's actually, that actually is a beautiful theory that can be done. It's a beautiful piece of geometry that I think Jason Starr uh, discussed fairly uh, thoroughly last week, but I'll review it anyway. So we define, first of all, a smooth, so the type of big pieces is the following. A smooth projective variety P is said to be rationally connected if through any two points, if through any two points in P, there is a, well, basically what I'm trying to say is that I can I can draw a rational curve through any two points. The reason I say there is a map is because uh, uh, if, if the curve is, if, 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 if P itself is a rational curve, what does it mean to draw a rational curve on a rational curve? I mean, you can, uh, if, or if P is a point, a point is considered rationally connected. So can't draw a rational curve on the point. <clears throat> okay, so, so this is the picture, so this is rational. And uh, Jason, uh, I'm sure, mentioned uh, quite a few equivalent definitions for a smooth variety to be rationally connected. This is actually what's not evident from this definition, that this is actually an equivalence relation. If you have uh, three points, well, all you see is just two rational curves, a chain of rational curves. But in fact, once, once a variety is rationally connected, then any chain of rational curve can be kind of pushed a little bit and, and smoothed out. Uh, this is really a beautiful piece of theory, which I don't know if Jason had time to discuss in detail. <coughs> uh, also, there's a, there's a completely geometric uh, condition w which says that there is a rational curve in there that th whose normal bundle is ample. So it can be moved in any way. So that's a completely infinitesimal situation. Uh, only near, nearby a single rational curve, and yet it's enough. Also, Jason must have told you that this is a really nice property, it's stable under birational equivalence. It's stable under the generations. If you have a family of rationally connected, both the generations and the formation, if you have a family of rationally connected varieties, and one, which is a smooth family, sorry, if you have a family of variety, a smooth family, if one fiber is rationally connected, then the other is rationally connected. And, and so on and so forth. This is really a nice class of varieties. The only rationally connected surfaces are rational. So for, for surfaces, it's a boring condition. But already for threefolds, it's, 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 it's interesting. Okay.
so I, I said that I want to use this to break a variety into pieces and that still I'm sure this is something that Jason uh, mentioned because this is one of his, his, uh, his most spectacular results. Um, so I, I should just say that this is, I combine here two theorems. And again, I will need to draw a picture on the board. So why, why don't I draw the picture first? So if you have any variety X, then what you can do is at least up to birational equivalence. So let's ignore this birational equivalence X prime to X. I already replaced X by something birational to it. There's a well-defined map X to Z such that the fibers are, collect everything that has to do with rational curves. So the fibers, so the generic fiber, in fact, what I said is if, if you have a fiber which is rationally connected, then all smooth fibers are. Uh, so, so that it's enough. So, so uh, you have, a, a, you have a, a vibration, so let's ignore the X prime to X, <coughs> such as a general fiber or generic fiber, doesn't matter, is rationally connected. So, so the fibers are rationally connected varieties. So here's Z, here's X, everything in here, every two points in here can be connected by rational curves. And, and on the other hand, on Z itself, I don't see almost, well, there might be some rational curves, but th they're not everywhere. Z is not covered by rational curve. It's not unit root. So everything that can be sort of connected by rational curves is already in the fibers of this map. So this is exactly what it says here. The general fiber is rationally connected, and Z is not unit ruled. Uh, let's ignore this, this part for the time being. You can see that in the notes. This is just to. <clears throat> the rational map that you have here, so this is only a rational map, is called the MRC vibration, the maximal rationally connected vibration of X. <coughs> and Z of X uh, is called the MRC quotient of X. Um, or I think Jason might have called it a rational quotient, but it's not rational, so I don't like it. It's, it's the opposite of rational. Um, the MRC vibration, it, it, just the way it's written as a universal property, it's the, it's the final dominant rational map with rationally connected vibration, area fiber. So if you have any map X to uh, W where the fibers are rationally connected, then um, then it factors like, then, then the MRC vibration uh, factors like this. So it collects all the, all the rational connected stuff in fibers in one, uh, in one piece. And what I want to do. So now I want to tie this. So, so every variety can be broken into the, the thing that has to do with rational curves and the rest. And since we have an idea of what arithmetic should be on rational curves, uh, we can conjecture that, that this, this can actually work in higher dimension for the analogous thing. So the conjecture which I think the only place where I've seen it stated as a conjecture is in Campana's papers, although other people have definitely worked on something like this. Conjecture says <coughs> that um, if P is a rationally connected variety over a number field, then rational points are potentially dense. So at least after extending the number field, uh, by a finite amount, so there exists a, 
well, L over K finite, such that um, P of L is dense in is dense in P. This is known for a, if you replace K by, by a number field, there's a stronger result that is known by, uh, for, uh, for a function field of a, of a curve of an algebraically closed field, then in fact the rational points are dense. You don't need an extension for such a field. Uh, and you can view some of the stuff that Yuri Chinkel told you about as uh, going in the direction of uh, understanding the conjecture and, and understanding it even better. All right. I want to remove this. So one piece of varieties uh, is going to be rationally connected varieties. Now suppose that, that we don't have a rationally connected vibration on a variety X, then what does it say? It says, well, at least conjecturally, so, so, so the rationally connected vibration is trivial, which means that X is not uniruled. <coughs> and conjecturally, a non-uniruled variety by the conjecture I mentioned before, by the minus infinity conjecture, has differential form, so its Kodaira dimension is bigger or equal to zero. And if its Kodaira dimension is bigger or equal to zero, then you can take the differential forms and use the map defined by these differential forms, which I call the Itaka vibration. X goes to I of X. Maybe I should have written it. I should. So I of X is defined by, by the spaces of it's sufficiently high pluricanonical differential forms. <clears throat> and um, it's very, so one thing that is not difficult to show is that the fibers of this are always of Kodaira dimension zero. So you don't need any f fancy additivity results. It's almost um, automatic to show that um, from, uh, from the vibration inequality, the easy additivity that uh, sub-additivity that the fibers have to have Kodaira dimension zero. Okay, so it, this is like, this is very much like an elliptic vibration. <clears throat> and on, on elliptic vibration, we also know that we have lots of rational points. So here's a, oh, so, so here's a conjecture of Campana which says that, Sorry, not on elliptic, on, elliptic, on elliptic curves we have lots of rational points. So, so Campana looks at the fibers of uh, the Itaka vibration, I mean those varieties which are uh, of Kodaira dimension zero, and he conjectures that if uh, F is a variety of Kodaira dimension zero, then, the, then rational points are potentially dense. And really there are, there are dozens of papers now by Hassett and Chinkel and Bogomolov and Harris and Koliotelen and many people trying to give examples of that this is actually true. Trying to construct points on such varieties. It's not always easy. So these two conjectures are conjectures about existence of rational points, of lots of rational points, uh, at least after extensions of the number field on varieties of Kodaira dimension, uh, on either rationally connected varieties or Kodaira dimension zero varieties, which are sort of building blocks. You start with your variety, you take the maximal rational connected variety, you get something which is uh, of, of non-negative Kodaira dimension, so it has an Itaka vibration, that's the next piece sort of, of, of the variety. You can, can try to break it up further. And that's something I will try to do. in a bit. I think, I think uh, Hassett gave you a, a, a number of examples of this for surfaces, right? For, 
uh, rational points on certain K3 surfaces or? Oh, okay. But we did talk about rational points on surfaces. So let's look at the other extreme. Those varieties that, that, uh, that, that in, are in the zoo, that are the analog of curves of positive gene, of, sorry, curves of genus bigger than one. And here we have a, a conjecture, a very inspiring conjecture, which says, well, this is, this is Lang's conjecture in weak form. Uh, suppose X over a number field is a smooth projective variety. Uh, in fact, it could be just any field which is finely generated over Q. It doesn't need to be a number field, but number fields are good enough. Then the rational points are not the risky dense in X. So Lang conjectures that, uh, that if you throw away a closed subset, you won't find any rational point on your variety, if the variety is of general type. And in fact, uh, motivated by uh, other types of geometry, which I will not discuss here, Lang uh, was a conjecture where, what kind of closed variety you have to throw away so that all you'll, you'll find once you throw that away are just sporadic rational points that you, you have to construct by, one by one. Um, and so the conjecture, uh, so there's a geometric conjecture that says that if X is a smooth projective variety of general type, then, then you can try to collect all the, all the sub-varieties which, sub which are not of general type. And theoretically, they could be a dense, a countable collection of, uh, which might be dense, of, of sub-varieties. Uh, and Lang says that, no, it's not so, it's not so wild. It's, he conjectures that there is a Zariski closed proper subset, S of X, <coughs> whose irreducible components are not of general type. So these are the pieces of S of X. And such that every subset which is any other uh, sub-variety which is not of general type, sorry, sub-variety, is actually contained in this S of X. So Lang conjecture that, the, that, for, uh, that there's kind of a, a, a non-general type locus which contains everything that is not of general type, okay? No, it does not depend on anything. It's a geometric thing. And here's, here's what is, it's arithmetic consequences, what we call Lang's conjecture in strong form, which says that, assume that, the, the, that geometric conjecture holds, that let X be any smooth projective variety of general type over a finitely generated field, then for any uh, field, the, the, for any such field, the, the number of rational points away from S of X is finite. So of course you can, by extending the field, you can construct a, a rational point here, a rational point here, but what the conjecture says is that you can't, you can't get a, a big collection away from S of X. So, so notice the difference between finite and, and the risky dense in the weak form and non risky dense in the weak form. So this actually says where the possible density can occur, only inside S of X. One, one small application of the weak, already of the weak form of Lang conjecture, assume that the weak Lang conjecture holds, then um, assume that you have a variety of a, defined over a number field, assume that there is a dominant rational map from X to a variety of general type. Well, Lang says that the rational points here are not dense. But any rational point here will map to a rational point here, at least where the rational map is defined. So let's throw away the closed subset where the rational map is not defined. Then 
then the rational points here cannot be dense because uh, uh, this is a dominant rational map. So any rational map ha here has to map to the closed subset and the inverse of a closed subset here because this is a dominant map is a, is a proper closed subset. Okay? So the, if, if it maps a variety of general type, then according to Lang, rational points cannot be dense. So we'll see how to apply this. So, the, uh, so okay, so, so this, is, this is Lang's conjecture. Uh, I think Yuri is not here. And uh, so if you asked Yuri, he would say this is, this can't be true. But, but really, okay, so here's, here's one reason why, why, why people would say this can't be true. There's uh, the following uh, consequence of Lang's conjecture. So, uh, so you can apply Lang's conjecture to judiciously chosen varieties. One judiciously chosen variety is the moduli space of curves or curves with a number of points on them. And if you apply it carefully, you get the following theorem, which is due to Caporasso, Harris, and Mazur. And the theorem says that if weak, the weak line conjecture holds, and if you have a number field K, um, I guess I should use this rather than point on my transparency. You have a number field K, and you fix a genus of curves g bigger than one, then for, there's a, there's a uniform bound on the number of points on all curves over that same number field of the same genus. So there is a bound n k g so that for every genus g curve, the number of points over that field k is not more than the, this bound. Now this, this uh, is uh, quite a bit more than people expected before. And it's a wonderful consequence of a nice geometric conjecture. It's, you, you, you conjecture something about higher dimensional variety, you get something wonderful about curves. Uh, here's a refinement due to a student of mine, Patricia Pacelli. Uh, the the uh, refinement says that, in fact, this bound depends only on the degree of the number field. You still have to take points over a, a fixed number field, but, but, uh, but it's, uh, the, the number of points is bounded only in terms of the degree of the number field. Uh, you can ask what happens if you assume strong Lang conjecture, and this, is, this really throw, throws people off. Uh, assume uh, that strong, so this is again a caparasso aris mazur theorem, assume strong Lang and fix a genus, then there is a uniform bound and number of points on almost all curves. So, uh, so let's read it, you have to think about it. There's an, a bound depending only on the genus, such that for any uh, field K, the number of uh, rational points is not more than G. This, uh, without a caveat, this is nonsense. But uh, this is only true for all but finitely many genus G curves C over K. So for any field, any arithmetic field, I can. I should be able to write down a finite collection of curves, kind of offending curves, such that for all other curves, the, 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 uh, the number of points is bounded by this n. Really, really wonderful, but uh, this good number of people say Lang's conjecture cannot be true. But you know what? I don't care. Um, because, because, uh, let, let me just, what, okay, yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay, so, no, so, so if you look at, if you collect all degree D points on a curve, then you can have curves with many degree D. Of course, but does the You can always take a curve which has, of any genus, which is a default cover of P1. Okay, you can try pushing the envelope, but uh, there's only so far that you can. I mean, there are, there are results in that direction, uh, but um, and there are results that actually follow from Fartig's theorem if you if you don't go too far. But um, but let's leave it. I mean, there's a lot of inspiring ideas that you can bring. 
So let me let me just uh, so this is this is just a point made by my colleague Joe Silverman, which says, well, well, maybe I, I need the whole board. And the point is that even if you don't believe Lang conjecture, Lang's conjecture, it's something that is worth studying, understanding. Uh, I mean, it's not the end. Even if it's not true, if it were not, you know, depending on the day of the week, I might think that it's true or not. But, um, but, but even if it happens not to be true, what what do we have? So we know that on rational on P n. The, the number of, or P1, the, the rational points, number of rational points grows polynomially in terms of a bound on a height. So this is a, something that Yuri showed you. On, on abelian varieties and stif, stuff like that, the rational points grow logarithmically. So this looks more like this. And what Lang conjecture says is that for, let me try to be, Careful. So what Lang's conjecture says that uh, that that uh, on varieties of general type, it looks more like this. But um, what Silverman says, well, uh, you can say, uh, you can say that this is this is a constant. But what Silverman says that uh, for the naked eye, so if this is, this is B or polynomial in B, and this is a polynomial in log B. For naked eye, this is just log log b is a constant function for any practical purposes. So maybe that's the way rational points on a variety of general type behave. Anyway, let, let's 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 leave it as that. So we have Conjectures about having a lot of rational points on, um, on varieties which are rationally connected or uh, Kodari dimension zero. We have conjectures about having few rational points on varieties uh, which are um, of general type. And we want to know what happens in between. And that's, that's basically the, the, what I want to cover the rest of today and, and, and tomorrow, and maybe continue, depending, I mean, that's a, kind of the center point of what I want to tell you. We want to search, remember what I said in the beginning, uh, uh, geometry determines arithmetic, at least after you throw away the, the, the randomness. Um, you want to have some invariants that will tell you what the general arithmetic behavior of a variety will be. So uh, I, this is something I stole from a lecture of Caporasso, which is on, on, the, on the web page, on my web page, um, uh, which, which just investigates a little more uh, in detail the situation of surfaces. And I, I bet uh, Brandon told you something about this. <clears throat> so, here is what, what Lang conjecture says, and we, we, we know many examples of, well, quite a number of examples, maybe not many, of, of surfaces of Kodaira dimension zero which have few rational points, non-dense rational points. We don't know any counterexample to Lang's conjecture. As to Campana's conjecture, we know by now many examples that, that uh, Brandon and Yuri and others have worked on of surfaces of Kodaira dimension zero that have a potentially dense rational points. So e, any product of two elliptic curves or any abelian, variety, uh, abelian surface, but many others, many K3 surfaces and so on, that, that we know have potentially dense rational points. We don't know an example of a counter, a counter example to Campana's conjecture. In uh, the Kodaira dimension minus infinity case, we have a complete dichotomy just like in curves. If you have a rational surface, then it has a lot of rational points. And if, if you have something that is uh, by rational to P1 cross a curve of genus bigger than one, then 
then uh, rational points cannot be dense because they have to map to rational points on the curve. We have a similar case here in Kodai dimension one. There are many examples, and I'll give you one, of a surface, uh, surf surfaces of Kodai dimension one which have potentially dense rational points. Uh, there are also the, these examples, and I'll give you more than this, of surfaces uh, which, uh, which do not, because they map to curves of, of um, a genus bigger than one. So this is just what I said here. Um, so we, 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 we definitely understand what's happening here. Uh, we, the, the understanding of what's happening here is that I've given you so far is, in, is not complete yet. So we still have to do something about Kodaya dimension one. One thing you immediately see here is that the Diophantan geometry of a variety is not governed by, by the Kodaya dimension. The two uh, lines here, minus infinity and one, show that you can have the same Kodaya dimension but very different uh, arithmetic behavior. Yes, only. I will get to that. I will get to that. Yeah, I will get to that. It's, it's not me who has the example, it's somebody else, but yeah. So, the, so, um, so I, I want to give you two examples of surfaces of Kodaira dimension one, which exactly, uh, okay, which exactly brings up, the second one brings up this point. So uh, first of all, I want to give you an example here that really you can have a lot of rational points on, on the surface of Kodai dimension one. And I should draw pictures on the board. I'm probably driving the person taking the video crazy because I'm using that projector and this board. But So the idea is as follows. You, ta you take P2 and you take two cubic curves and everything should be defined over Q and you can take the cubic curves to, be, to pass through two rational points. You can make these rational points to be non-torsion so that the difference is non-torsion on, on any one of these two uh, cubic curves, two elliptic curves. <coughs> uh, so, so the total space of the family of cubic curves that you get is an elliptic surface, fiber by P1, which is just a blow up of P2 at these nine points. The, the, the total space of the, of the pencil is the blow up of the, of the family of curves uh, of P2 at the base points of the pencil. So in fact, you have not just two sections coming from these two points, you have nine sections and you have more because I assume that the, the, that, this, that the difference here was not torsion. And of course you have, you have a number of, in, have exactly 12 singular fibers, but we don't worry about those for the time being. Now, next, what you do, so this is rational. This is not Kodaira dimension one. But you can take a, a base change by the map that is described there. You take a base change by uh, taking a kth root of the, of the parameter t here. So s to the power k equals t. And you, in order for the example to work, you need the k to be at least three. And what happens is you get, I mean, you ba just, just pull, pull back and you calculate, and this is one of, uh, one of the exercises in the notes, you calculate the Kodaira dimension of this. The Kodaira dimension of this is one. So this is, this is the surface S1 and KS1 is 1. This is a classical and important calculation that every student should do. But what do we have on this? We still have the pullback of these two sections. We have more sections. And, uh, and these are non-torsion. Uh, then, uh, then, uh, then you can do the following. Uh, Take any rational point on P1, the fiber is an elliptic curve, 
over, over the rational. It has these two points, but these two points, the is, if this is the origin, then this is not a torsion point, so you have an infinity many points on this, on this elliptic curve. And that happens for almost all, so it happens uh, for all points where this, all rational points where this misses the, you know, the, the maser torsion points. The, the, so if all, almost everywhere these are going to be, uh, the, the restriction of this non-torsion section is going to be non-torsion. So you'll have infinitely many points on infinitely fibers, so there are, there are uh, x of k, in fact, x of q is dense in this particular example. But example two is on the other side, and that, that, that brings about the question that Henri, the, the, uh, the, see, once you see that Coderre dimension is not good enough, in the example I wrote there, it seemed like all you need to check whether the, the rational points are this or not is whether or not there's a map to a variety of general type a dominant map to a variety of general type. This shows that this is not the case. So existence of maps of variety of general type is not enough to say whether, whether or not you have dense rational points. So here's a variety which does not have any map to a variety of general type. Here's a surface that does not have any map to a variety of general type, to a surface or is not, is not of general type, does not map to a curve of genus bigger than one, yet the points are not dense. And this is again a Chevalier-Ve uh, argument, just like Henri has shown you last week. So suppose C is a hyperelliptic curve. This is another picture of. So C is a hyperelliptic curve, and E is an elliptic curve. So C, B, C being hyperelliptic, it has an involution. I can also cook E to have an involution, uh, but a fixed point, the base point, a fixed point free involution, namely translation by a two torsion point. So I'm assuming that E has a two torsion point. Uh, what did I call it, A? Call it there, A. And therefore, the product, uh, product surface has an involution described there. X, Y goes to, so E, uh, on E I add the torsion point, and on C I do the involution, the hyperelliptic involution. That's a fixed point free involution because it's already fixed point free on E. So I have the, so the map from, so this is, this is Y. And I have this involution phi tilde on Y. A fix, so I have an etal map from Y to another surface. And this surface does not map to C, but it maps to the quotient of C by the involution, namely P1. Uh, so this is S2, which is the quotient of y by phi tilde. And an easy argument, which I skipped, it is in your notes, it says that if you have an etal cover, then the Kodari dimension is the same. A finite etal cover, Kodari dimension is the same. So the Kodari dimension of S2 is the Kodari dimension of E cross C, which is 1. On the other hand, uh, and, and also S2 of k is not dense by Chevalier V. It has an etal cover by something where the rational points are, are not dense. Uh, Chevalier V and Faltings, <laughs> where the rational points are not dense because <laughs> it's a big theorem. Uh, and, uh, but, but S2 does not have any map to a, to, a, to a Faltings curve, to a curve of genus bigger than one. Because the only, if you had one, then it would have to be either E or an image of C, and the only thing that C maps to in this picture is, is P1. So it could map, it does map to E, but it does not map to C. So that's, that answers your question. So life is more complicated. You still argue in faultings. And, and the topic of the next lecture will exactly be how to understand What's in between general type and, and uh, Kodari dimension zero? <coughs> but I want you to remember these two examples because they are going to come up. I don't think I will start lecture two today, but oh, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I will. Let me just make a very quick uh, a discussion of the open case. I only discussed proper varieties so far 
just in analogy, and the analogy is important for me for, for what will come up later. Uh, I want to discuss the open case. Uh, I want to understand uh, integral points on open varieties. So just as uh, for curves on open varieties, the natural thing to study is integral points. I take a smooth projective variety X bar uh, with a reduced uh, normal crossing divisors on X bar called D, and I call X the complement, and um, the notation differs in the, in the literature, so you might find other notations for uh, maybe K bar of X is a Kodair dimension. So that this is the logarithmic Kodair dimension of X, or K log of X, is the Kodair, the, is the Itaka dimension of X bar with the divisor class KX, KX bar plus D. So you throw in the boundary divisor, so to speak. Uh, it is important, though, that the boundary divisor has to have nice singularity. So reduced normal crossing is the analog of the, for the open thing, I, I, I want smooth. Okay, so it's, it's kind of uh, as good as it gets. So, I, so uh, I, I'm not sure what the common notation is. The, there are more than one notation in the literature. An easy um, uh, exercise is that this number is independent of the completion. Um, and it, we say that X is of logarithmic general type if this logarithmic Kodair dimension is the dimension of X. And we have a, an analog of Lang's conjecture, which is the following. Remember that I need to work with integral points, and integral points live on integral models. So I have to uh, spread out my variety over a ring of integers. So suppose x is a model of x, a script x is a model of x over, uh, over the ring of s integers of the number field. And, s is, and then I define s integral points in the usual way, just schematic points of this scheme script x. And the lang voigta conjecture says that if, if the variety itself is of logarithmic general type, then NC integral points are not the risky dense. This is a in direct analogy with a table I had for you in the end of the first uh, of lecture zero. Where is this? I'm going to suffer for this. This is the, the table I had for curves table I had for curves that which said that if a curve is of logarithmic general type, there are only finitely many points. That, that is a theorem. In higher dimension, it's conjectured. And that's the lang voigta conjecture. It's part of a, a more refined conjecture of Voigta that has to do with heights. Uh, and uh, I might get to it in the very last day of of this course. I, I said that I'm going to be in trouble for doing this. All right. So you can imagine that just as, as the line conjecture has wonderful implications for curves, that there are wonderful implications even for elliptic curves. Uh, by the lang voigta conjecture, which says something about finiteness of a certain type of integral points in a uniform way. You have to be careful. You have to take integral points on semi-stable models for this to work out. And uh, just as, as before, uh, this, even though the conjecture is very inspiring, you, you ask yourself whether you can believe the conjecture if it has such wonderful results. The conjecture in particular, if you, if you take the case where x equals x bar where, and d is empty, then that, that's, you get back your line conjecture. So the conjecture is a generalization <coughs> of, uh, of Lang's conjecture. Uh, 
or if, if, you, if you insist on, uh, well, remember that Siegel, okay, so, so the, there's, a, there's an accident w with curves, which is that any open curve is affine. But you can, you, yes, you can ask what happens when, uh, the only cases that are known are, in, well, almost the only cases that are known. There are the two types of cases that are known. One case that is known, or kind of general cases. One case is sub varieties of semi abelian varieties. Everything is known there due to faultings and others. Um, and um, another is the case of the moduli space of, um, of abelian varieties. which is an open variety for which, uh, for which, I mean, basically Shafarevich conjecture is a statement about the moduli space of abelian varieties. Well, only the cases of this conjecture that, that, uh, that are amenable to, to taking uh, to taking covers and, and in higher dimensions, well, you don't you don't have as much way uh, as much freedom to work with uh, fundamental groups and cook up covers. So it's not completely general. The uh, faultings implies Siegel does help you in some cases, but not in general. <coughs> ah. This is an example. This is something I should have put. Okay. So, in the next two minutes, I want to just philosophize a bit about what's what what's coming. Uh, and what's coming is a Campana's program, which whose goal is exactly to understand what comes in between. You're surprised that your name is appearing here, right? <laughs> Uh, what comes in between Cordaira dimension, um, Cordaira dimension zero and general type. Uh, there are all sorts of varieties that occur there and you want to understand when you could uh, imagine that the variety would have a dense a collection of rational points and when it doesn't. And uh, here's a little bit of background. Uh, so, so the idea, so, so as Henri asked, uh, Henri asked whether it's enough to just uh, look at maps to varieties of general type, and the answer was no by the example S2. But you can, uh, what, what Campana comes to show, show us that maybe there's something else. Uh, so instead of looking at maps to varieties of general type, you look at maps to, uh, to dragons of general type, and that's, that's good enough. And these dragons are what Campana calls obifolds, and I don't like it because, because it's misleading. I call them uh, Campana constellations. Okay, um, so uh, you, uh, you should be forewarned that this is not a universally accepted terminology, although I asked Campana about the word constellation, and he actually loves it. So it depends whether or not it will catch. And I, I think it makes sense, the picture that you see. Is so let's go back to where we ha what, what we had. We had two examples still on the board of S1 and S2 with Codera dimension one, but they had the same Codera dimension, but their arithmetic behavior was, was uh, vastly different. And Campana's question is, um, is there an underlying structure on the base P1 in both cases that distinguishes between the two cases? In this particular situation, in this particular example, and almost completely in general for surfaces, uh, there, there is an old structure that we can use, and the old structure is truly called orbifolds. Uh, the key point uh, is that S2 was obtained as a quotient of E cross a hyperelliptic curve by an involution, and on that, in, that involution on, on the hyperelliptic curve had 2G plus 2 fixed points, 
And, and that in, so if you think about the inverse images here, what you get as a fiber here is the quotient of the elliptic curve by the two torsion translation. And this means that the fiber is a double fiber. So in fact, you have 2G plus 2 double fibers on S, S2, namely that 2G plus 2 points on P1, which are kind of weird points where, where something happens on the fiber. And uh, oh, I, I see why you, you OK, so the name, your name will appear here. Uh, so, uh, so in fact, the map from S2 to P1 is not just a map to P1 itself, but to P1 with extra structure, a structure that, uh, that we called an algebraic stack, or orbifold, which is obtained by uh, locally taking a root of the equation of the, the divisor uh, of these two G2 plus two points. Uh, so, there's a, a an extra structure which is called an orbifold structure. I will not discuss it in detail because I'll discuss something else that happens more generally. An orbifold structure on P1 obtained by taking a square root of, uh, of the defining equation. And this is something that was discussed in a paper of Darmon Granville. And the beautiful thing, one of the, it's a beautiful paper. Oh, it was a lecture. One of the beautiful things there is the title of that paper. I love this. It doesn't actually tell you that they go out and develop a theory there. They just, the title is, on the equations, x to the p plus y to the p equals something and something else. Uh, so, um, very explicit. But they consider, so what, what you consider is the canonical sheaf of this orbifold. And the point is that the canonical sheaf of the orbifold is not just the canonical sheaf of P1, but you have to add uh, one half of this divisor D. The, the correct formula is one minus one half, but it so 